Yes, Onup, can I be heard? Onup, can I be heard? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hope the department is there. And kindly inform me whenever Dr. Ashit Panda and the speaker joins. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are waiting for our distinguished speaker today. Dear students, don't unmute your mind. Okay, always be in mute. If you have anything to ask, please put it in the message box. Okay.
Monoop, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, has Dr. Anup Kumar Sinha joined? Yes, sir. He is with us. Thank you very much. Has Dr. Uh, Ashit Panda joined? Anup, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Has Dr. Panda joined? Yes, sir, join. Ashit sir, has already join. Yes, sir. Yes, it is. Hello, Sujata, sir. Am I audible? Hello, Onu, can I be heard? Onu, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Good. Uh, uh, has Has Dr. Panda joined? Yes, 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 I have joined. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you all the participants. Uh, with the kind permission of our beloved principal, Dr. Manubindu Bandan, and uh, our head of the department, Dr. Rashid Panda, I'm beginning uh, today's proceedings. Uh, thank you all the participants who have joined, joined today because this is being streamed live on YouTube. I thank our speaker today, our guest today, Dr. Arnav Kumar Sina, Assistant Professor, Department of English, School of Literature and Cultural Studies, uh, University of Badwan, West Bengal. I thank Dr. Manavid Mandol once again for being the chief patron of this six-day online lecture series on English Literature 2021 organized by the Department of English, Builder College, for encouraging us and taking this initiative. Uh, I, Dr. Sujata Ghosh, convener uh, of this six-day online lecture series on English Literature 2021, now here we request Dr. Rashid Panda, who is the organizing secretary of this six-day online lecture series. And uh, Dr. Panda is also the accuracy coordinator of Builder College, and he is also the Head Department of English, Belda College, and request Dr. Panda to kindly give uh, the welcome speech today, introduce Dr. Sina, and kindly declare this very six day online lecture series on English literature 2021, organized by the Department of English, Belda College, as open. Over to you, Dr. Panda. Uh, am I audible, uh, Sujato? Am I audible? Yes, 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 absolutely. Actually, uh, my camera is not properly working, so I may not be visible to you. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience. Okay. Uh, so, okay. uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, respected research person, Dr. Anup Kumar Sina, <laughs> assistant professor at the Department of English and Cultural Studies, uh, the University of Badwan. My dear colleagues at the Department of English and co-organizers of this uh, lecture series, uh, Dr. Sujato Ghosh, Onu Prokhit, uh, Mr. Minal Kanti Das, uh, Mr. R Ms. Ritu Porna, uh, and uh, m the Mrs. Soma, uh, they are with us. And my dear students, uh, on behalf of the Department of English, Bilda College, and as the IQC coordinator of the college and also as the chairman of this lecture series uh, organizing committee, it's my great pleasure and honor uh, to welcome you all on the auspicious occasion of the inauguration of the six day online lecture series on English literature 2021 organized by our department. In the midst of an escalating pandemic, organization of this lecture series 
uh, has been primarily intended to offer our students ample scopes of being enriched with the scholarly deliberations of distinguished academics. It is also intended to bring back the student's attention to serious study in the era of pandemic, when academic institutions have remained closed for a long period and students are increasingly getting bored with the online method of teaching. You will also be pleased to know that the scope or range of the topics of uh, lecture chosen by our research persons in this lecture series is immense. While some of the lectures will focus on exploring different facets of British romantic and metaphysical poetry, some of the research persons have chosen to offer their deliberations on emerging terrains of post-colonial literature. Our research persons are all leaders in the field and I am fully confident that they are knowledge, experience, and expertise will provide important insights on unexplored terrains of English literature, which are of topical interest to the students. I heartily welcome all the distinguished research persons of this lecture series and convey our thankfulness and gratitude to them for accepting our invitation. Today, we are proud to have an eminent scholar uh, Dr. Anup Kumar Sina among us, who is our first speaker in this lecture series. Dr. Sina is not only a sound academic, uh, but uh, a very uh, generous and excellent human being. And I am very much happy that I enjoy a very intimate personal relationship with him. We are privileged that Dr. Sina has given us his valuable time for delivering a talk today and we want to sincerely thank you sir for honoring our invitation in spite of your very busy and tight schedule i heartily welcome you i also wish to extend my deep appreciation to our chief patron dr manavendra mondal principal of bilda college our iqsc members and governing body members our oil research and all those who have given their active support to organize this seminar. And I am sure that this lecture series will add another feather to the rich historical legacy of the college on the eve of its assessment and accreditation by the NAC. I am also optimistic that this is going to be an extremely enthralling and illuminating lecture series for all concerned, and we see a grand success. Uh, with this, I formally declared this lecture series to be open. Thank you very much. Now let me take the opportunity of introduce to you all today's speaker, Dr. Arnav Kumar Shina. The title of his talk is Understanding Blake's Philosophy, Reading the Lamb and the Tiger. He will analyze uh, two important poems by uh, Charles Lamb uh, during his uh, deliberation. Anu Kumar Sina is assistant professor at the Department of English and Culture Study, the University of Barwan. He has co edited the books Indian Fiction in English, Mapping the Contemporary Literary Landscape. The book got published in 2014. And he has also co edited another book, uh, Indian. Uh, English Poetry and Drama, Changing Canons and Responses, and the book got published in 2019. Dr. Sina has published 18 articles uh, in several international, national journals and books, and he has also presented more than 20 papers at national and international conferences and seminars. In 2019, Dr. Sina received funding from German Association, for post-colonial studies and visited University of Bremen, Germany to present a paper at an international conference organized by GAPS, German Association for Post-Colonial Studies. Uh, Sina was invited by the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Simla, for presenting a paper at an international seminar organized by the IIAS in 2019. It's forthcoming publication 
is an essay on endangered diaspora which will be published by Ruthless UK in an edited volume on Kalapani crossings. May I now invite Dr. Anup Kumar Sina, uh, today's uh, research person, to kindly deliver his lecture and enrich us. Thank you, Ashit. I hope I am audible. Is the voice yes, clear? Yes, yes. You are perfectly audible, on Okay, Thank fine. you. Fine. So, uh, Ashit, when he actually requested me almost uh, two weeks ago regarding this uh, lecture, uh, I couldn't uh, say uh, no because uh, Ashit is a very good friend of mine and uh, we have a very good, in that way, a very warm relationship. So, uh, at the outset, thank you, like, thank you, Anna. We yeah. are very much grateful that you have accepted our invitation. Sir. No, no, no. You being a very good friend of mine, I couldn't say no. And uh, obviously, I, I consider this as an opportunity also because uh, uh, during this pandemic situation, uh, it's not possible for uh, for people like us to go directly to different colleges and deliver lectures. So this is a kind of an opportunity through which we. Uh, we are able to, in a sense, communicate with uh, the students and students also, in a sense, get, an, get a good opportunity to interact with us. So I usually do not decline these invitations. Now, at the outset, uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizing committee of this uh, six-day lecture, online lecture series uh, for inviting me. And as I said, that it's really an honor for me to uh, speak uh, uh, and and obviously speak as the first uh, resource person in this uh, six day online lecture series and i also thank uh, the principal of uh, Belda college for inviting me now the topic as it has already been mentioned by oshi uh, my my topic in fact uh, includes uh, two very important aspects uh, one obviously is understanding Blake's philosophy. And the other one, obviously, is uh, to make a kind of a close reading of two very important poems written by Blake. Uh, one is uh, the lamb and, and, the, and the other one is the tiger. And these two uh, poems have been chosen by me because uh, I, I found that these two poems are in the syllabus, UG syllabus of Mithapur University, Mithashagur University. Now, before closely reading these two uh, poems, I would like to uh, discuss in detail uh, Blake's philosophy because I believe uh, that uh, it, is, uh, it is very important for the students to understand Blake's uh, philosophy. And if students understand Blake's philosophy, then it, it becomes uh, easy also for the students to understand Blake's thought process because apparently when we approach Blake's poems the, the poems appear to be quite simple uh, for for instance if anybody reads the poem lamb uh, it's 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 apparently a very simple poem but the poem contains very complex ideas very complex i would say philosophical thought similarly when we read a poem like london or when we read a poem like uh, The Tiger, written by Blake, then we can understand that uh, apparently, again, the poem, these poems appear to be quite simple uh, because the language that Blake chooses is quite lucid. Uh, apparently, there is no complexity at the surface level of the poem. But if we make a sort of a deep reading of these poems, we realize that how uh, how how uh, important is Blake's philosophy and what actually Blake is intending to say, what actually is Blake's perspective uh, in these poems and and the other poems that he has written. Though I uh, in my discussion today I won't be able to refer to the other poems. I will strictly confine my discussion to these poems, these two poems. But as I said at the very beginning of my discussion, that it is very important for us to understand 
complex philosophy because without that you know these poems will always appear simple and we will never be able to understand blake's actual message we will never be able to understand blake's actual perspective now uh, before actually uh, discussing blake's uh, philosophy i would like to briefly discuss the 18th century social and cultural condition because uh, blake as a poet was an isolated figure he was an iconoclast and uh, as a as a person he was very importantly cut off from the uh, from the so called uh, the the, the socio cultural scenario he he in that way was a sort of a person who looked at the contemporary society uh, from a distance and uh, as a as a person he was he was not accepted by his contemporaries and the main reason for his lack of ac acceptance uh, was 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 uh, was was because blake uh, harbored or blake had in his mind certain ideas which were not in tune with the contemporary trend of thoughts now what were these contemporary trend of thoughts in fact 18th century as you all know uh, was uh, was an age of prose and reason and 18th century also happens to be important in the history of uh, europe because of the occurrence of french revolution so french revolution when it was uh, about to end you know at that point of time blake started writing his poems so when french revolution in fact had reached a sort of what you can say culminating stage blake started writing his poems and french revolution as we all know i'm not going to discuss in detail about the french revolution but french revolution as we all know uh you know impacted on the mind and the psyche of uh of the people living in europe and uh, french revolution also in fact uh, had a very revolutionary and reactionary uh, effect uh on the minds of the english people in fact a french revolution you can say created a sort of a profound cultural crisis in europe and this crisis was mainly because people after the occurrence of the french revolution were searching various ways to to execute those ideas that french revolution uh, in fact uh, had uh, uh, had had in a sense uh, uh, highlighted so you know the entire europe therefore was under the impact of french revolution and english people also were finding ways to assert their liberty uh, their fraternity and uh, you know their uh, you know this idea of equality so that was a stage almost you can say the last decade of the 18th century when you know the english people were you know struggling to deal with these ideals of the french revolution and you know Uh, if if we talk specifically about the english scenario then england was in a state of crisis how to achieve freedom how to achieve this ideal or uh, these these ideals uh, that that french revolution had in a sense highlighted so this is one very important aspect that you need to keep in mind and blake in fact uh, blake's poems can be read uh, as a sort of a response to french revolution because Blake often in his poems uh, seem to uh, you know as a poet he seems to criticize uh, you know this idea of freedom can people or can can individuals really achieve freedom okay so these questions have been very subtly raised by Blake in in his in his poems so blake was very importantly as a poet critical to french revolution 
and he was quite sure that French Revolution will, or the impact of French Revolution will ultimately lead to a big failure. People will not probably understand these ideals. So that's why uh, Blake, as you find, uh, or Blake's poems, as I said, can be read in response to French Revolution. So this is one very important cultural, or you can say, social condition. The second, obviously, is Industrial Revolution. Uh, during the 18th century, and particularly in the last two decades of the 18th century, England at that point of time was uh, was was uh, was undergoing uh, through a phase was was undergoing massive industrial uh, industrialization, and uh, you know cities were coming up, and and this is uh, something which you find in the poem London, uh, where you know Blake refers to. Uh, you know, the chartered dames, ships coming to the city, uh, trade and business booming in England and, and everywhere, uh, obviously, uh, the, the smoke of the city is, uh, is, is, is visible. So uh, England also, uh, during the last two decades of the 18th century, was, uh, was passing through a phase of industrialization, so rapid industrialization, and Blake Again, Blake's poems, many, many of Blake, Blake's poems can be read as a response to this industrial revolution, which, which started, in a sense, peaking during, uh, during that particular period, during, as I said, during the last two decades of the 18th century. And uh, as I said, that uh, 18th century also uh, was, uh, was, a, was, an, uh, was a period when uh, you know, wealth was flowing. In England, uh, because uh, England as a as a country was uh, developing in terms of trade and commerce, and uh, uh, you know due to this, uh, there uh, you know people for that matter, people were uh, becoming more and more materialistic in their outlook. And uh, the, uh, one one can easily refer to uh, Adam Smith's book. The Wealth of Nations, which was published in 1760, sorry, 1776. And in this book, uh, obviously, Adam Smith very clearly explains the, the evils uh, associated with, uh, uh, with the development of trade and commerce, with the, with the development of this, uh, what you can say, materialistic attitude. And how this materialistic attitude, as Smith says, uh, obviously, uh, deadens the or rather kills the human soul and and also uh, in a sense divides the society because uh, with money also uh, also comes power and obviously not all people can have money and not all people can have power therefore obviously there will occur as smith says uh, the division of labor so a group of people will be exploited and uh, the other group will try to try to reap the benefits of this exploitation. So Adam Smith, in in this book, The Wealth of Nations, obviously uh, makes us uh, aware of the uh, the impact of this extreme materialistic outlook. So this is another very important uh, context. Now, apart from industrialized uh, in uh, industrial revolution, apart from the French Revolution, now. Another very important aspect that occurred during the 18th century is the Enlightenment discourse. Kant, uh, the German philosopher Kant, uh, is considered to be uh, one of the pioneering critics in the in the field of Enlightenment discourse. And uh, this this uh, discourse of Enlightenment very importantly emphasized the importance uh, emphasized uh, the role of reason, uh, the, the role of reason in human life. And uh, Enlightenment discourse obviously uh, attempted to convince people to think in, uh, in, a, in a scientific and rational manner. And that's why with this dependence on reason, with this dependence on rationality, people slowly, uh, slowly uh, stopped, Im uh, stopped uh, imagining or this this rise of rationalism this this dependence on reason because 
uh, enlightenment uh, discourse convinced people uh, kant and the group of enlightenment uh, and and those critics who belong to this uh, particular uh, field of uh, theory they you know in europe and uh, everywhere they they convinced people to think in rational terms because enlightenment discourse uh, convinced people to think rationally and there and thereby they they uh, they very importantly asserted that if people start thinking reasonably only then society can progress so reason therefore uh, was important not imagination so with the rise of reason and that's why you see that 18th century is considered to be an age of prose and reason so with the rise of and, and the rise of this reason is because of this influence of the enlightenment discourse so people people were uh, people were uh, or or uh, you know in a sense you can say that people were uh, you know taught to uh, become reasonable people were rather uh, rather uh, influenced to become reasonable in their approach and this led to led to the killing of the imaginative spirit so blake as a poet and also as a man you know, witnessed all these important socio cultural conditions enlightenment impact of the enlightenment discourse impact of the industrial revolution impact of the french revolution and he had also you know read adam smith's uh, the wealth of nations so all these socio cultural conditions blake felt were not very much appropriate for a society which wants to uh which wants to develop so therefore you see that blake in his writings in his in his uh, in his uh, you know in his uh, uh, philosophical treatises uh, attempts to devise a particular philosophy a particular theory so now i'm slowly entering into blake's philosophy so why actually blake devised uh, a different kind of a philosophy because he wanted to convince people so that people uh, would adopt his philosophy adopt his theory and thereby uh, thereby uh, try to achieve uh, achieve uh, a sort of freedom a sort of what you can say being in a, a sort of feeling where people won't be won't feel that they are in a state of uh, in a state of uh, imprisonment because blake felt that the late 18th century condition was such a kind of a scenario where people uh, particularly the mind of the people uh, was as if imprisoned so therefore blake devised this philosophy devised his own philosophy in order to uh make people aware of the fact that they need to adopt this philosophy so that so that they can liberate themselves from from these socio cultural conditions which attempt to attempt to kill the uh, imaginative spirit and also at the same time attempt to transform humans into mechanical beings so blake never wanted that humans should become mechanical beings and that's why blake's philosophy is uh, is is uh, is a philosophy that is based on uh, as as critics call the myth of man it's it's a philosophy related to humans and that's why uh, blake's philosophy is uh, is considered to be a humanistic philosophy Uh, there is a critic uh, whose name is Martin K. Nurmi. Martin K. Dot Nurmi N U R M I Nurmi, and Martin K. Nurmi believes that Blake is uh, probably the most extreme humanist of all time, because Blake's philosophy, as I said, in Blake's philosophy, man is central to his reason. So when Blake visualizes the place of man you know man according to blake is 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 at the center of his idea the at the center of his philosophy and he considers 
quite interestingly blake considers uh, human you know he considers the human and the divine as the same so in blake's philosophy uh, you know the identity of god is not different from the identity of uh, of uh, of the human god and uh, the god and the human are the same and that's why as i said you know blake considers the human and the divine as the same and uh, there is uh, a particular text uh, written by uh, blake uh, which is titled jerusalem and it was published uh, if i'm not wrong it was published in 1820 now in this particular text blake very clearly says thou art a man he is actually referring to man thou art a man god is no more thine own humanity learn to adore so man and god are no different man is god himself and therefore blake says man must try to respect his humanity and if man can adore his humanity that is enough for blake so you see that blake therefore considers uh the human and the divine as the same and that's why his philosophy very importantly is based on the idea of what you can say divine humanity idea of divine humanity so divinity is is embedded in humanity divinity is not something separate from uh, humanity but divinity is very much embedded in humanity and that's why uh, blake obviously uh, or blake's philosophy can be termed as divine humanity and blake uh, believes that if humans are if humans make any sort of mistake it is because of the fact that humans have nurtured or nourished some kind of doubt so doubt is therefore very problematic for blake doubt is 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 a problematic idea in blake's philosophy because in blake's philosophy doubt as blake blake perceives doubt is like a satan like the figure of the satan it 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 creates chaos it it creates a uh, disorder so that's why uh, blake while interpreting the fall of uh, uh, fall of the adam and eve very clearly says that adam and eve fell from the eden because they were doubtful okay it's not that god had expelled them he doesn't consider the role of god uh, in that way uh, as, a, as a, in that way a, a very prominent one he he believes that adam and eve fell from the eden or were driven out from the eden because of the fact that both adam and eve had doubt and doubt as i said in blake's philosophy is uh, is is a satanic force it creates disorder it creates chaos so therefore uh, what blake actually devises is quite interesting blake in fact devises uh, the idea of four zoas now this again is quite interesting the four zoas z o a s zoas now the word zoa the plural form is zoas the word zoa is derived from uh, the greek word zoa z w a zoa which means life so the four zoas means life represented in four different ways or life in four different forms the four zoas is what you can say the four different uh, sort of uh, four different sorts of energies that are present in a particular human life so human life consists of four zoas and these four zoas should be orchestrated in such a way so that so that humans can can remain in peace so that humans can always remain in order but the the, the orchestration or rather the uh, the the synergy or the synchrony of these four joas if it is disrupted by doubt then humans 
uh, humans will will experience chaos so that's why what is therefore important in this concept of four zoas is also a sort of a journey so if humans have in their uh, in their in their body or in their mind these four different sorts of zoas or sorts of energies then obviously humans according to blake they pass through different phases in their life and that's why you know blake very significantly uses these words innocence and experience so passing from innocence and entering into experience is all about you know is all about the growth of man is all about the is all about blake's philosophy where blake very significantly talks about the maturing of the human mind and the human body and as the human mind and the body matures obviously when the human humans become experienced they encounter doubts and these doubts if they are tackled properly then again humans can achieve peace and unity but if doubts are not properly resolved if the, if the doubts are not properly addressed then then they, that can lead to perpetual chaos so you can very well understand that how blake as a poet by advocating this sort of a philosophy in a sense was also indicating to the contemporary scenario french revolution the enlightenment discourse industrial revolution all these had in a way according to blake created that doubt in the minds of the people so now humans need to reform their identity humans need to reform their self mentally and spiritually in order to reform the society if the society has to be reformed then humans every individual must reform themselves must mentally and spiritually transform themselves so that you know this negativity this chaos and this doubt can be can be eradicated and that's why in blake's philosophy you see that blake actually focuses on the development of the human mind or the development of the of the human body into four distinctive zoas that is what i have said earlier but also the, uh, you know as i said that in blake's philosophy uh, philosophy of man uh, in blake's theory uh, a human passes through four distinctive phases or four distinctive uh, a fourfold distinctive movement and what are these one number one is doubt second one is division third one is illumination and fourth unity so there is a particular text written by uh, blake which is titled the four zoas and in the four zoas where blake explains the four different psychic energies present in the human body blake says parallelly he says that humans actually uh, you know pass through also these four distinctive phases i again repeat the phases doubt division illumination and unity so unity is achieved at last and this unity can be, can be achieved only when a human passes through the phase of experience only when the human passes through the phase of chaos only when the human humans can can tackle the doubts and therefore you know in blake's philosophy the myth uh, you know uh, the myth of the albion a l b i o n the myth of albion is very important now who is albion albion is actually a mythical figure in blake's philosophy albion actually stands for for all man okay so albion a l b i o n albion is all man it is uh, a mythical figure representing all human beings and this albion is according to blake uh Uh, a sort of a creature who is uh, very much uh, in a state of order and uh, you know albion is representative of stability 
and obviously is representative of uh, peace. But Pilek shows that once this Albion goes to sleep and doubt enters in Albion's region or in Albion space, then chaos and disorder begins. And then it is the work of loss, LOS loss. Loss is one of the four zoas. Loss is the creative energy. Uh, loss is the imaginative spirit that must tackle or that must contest against the doubt in order to restore the normalcy, in order to restore the normalcy in Albion's, Albion's life. So let me just very briefly discuss the four zoas and then I shall quickly go to the poems. What are the four zoas? And before this, I had already said that the improvement or the development of the humans obviously uh, is very, uh, very clear to Blake. You know, humans develop in the form of doubt, division, illumination, and unity. And the four zoas representing four different psychic energies are number one, loss, LOS loss. Loss is indicative of the human imagination. Urizen, Urizen, U R I Z E N, loss, LOS loss, Urizen, U R I Z E N, Urizen is indicative of human reason. So all these are psychic energies. Luva, L U V A H, Luva, Luva is indicative of human emotion. And the fourth one, Tharmas, T H A R M S, Tharmas, Tharmas is indicative of the human instinct. So, loss, urizen, luva, Tharmas, these are the four different psychic energies which must, uh, you know, just to deviate a bit from this particular context, uh, you know, very much like, you know, Bain Johnson's humors, the concept of humors. So, all these four psychic energies, loss, urizen, luva, and Tharmas, they must synchronize and they must remain in a in a state of peace they must they must render a sort of sort of stability to this mythical figure of the albion and albion as i said is 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 uh, representative of the man the figure of the man now if there occurs any kind of chaos then it can occur only when there is a sort of an imbalance like in the poem London, you find the expression mind forge manacles. Mind forge manacles means Blake actually is referring to the, the Eurizenic spirit. That means man is dominated by reason to such an to, to such uh, to such an extent, to such a large extent that man now feels that his mind is psychologically imprisoned. So if there is any sort of imbalance between these four psychic energies, then there will be chaos, right? So these are the four zoas which Blake discusses. And keeping in mind these four zoas and keeping in mind the brief, uh, you know, philosophy that I discussed, let us let us now quickly proceed to uh, the, the poem, uh, the first poem that I intend to discuss, the poem that is titled uh, The Lamb. Now, the Lamb poem, the poem Lamb is important from the point of view of what you can say, as I said earlier, from the point of view of divine humanity. Because you see that here, uh, this child, uh, this, this small child, is not distinguishing himself from the nature. The child believes that the nature, he himself, and the God are one. So in the in the in the in in this particular in this particular poem, you see that the selfhood of the child, you know, is is in that sense in in a state of innocence. The child is, you know, is uniting with the with the divine force, because the child is saying that I am the Christ, I am the Lamb. That is what the child is saying. I am the Lamb. And the child is, as you find, also in a sense a part of the pastoral life. The child is also not, not, not uh, in a sense, uh, you know, different or separate from the from the from the nature, the surrounding nature. What is also quite interesting in this uh, particular poem is the fact that uh, this child is very much uh, in a in a in a state of his life where the child has 
not yet been introduced to the world of semiotics. And that's why the child asks many questions. The selfhood of the child has not yet developed. So you can also you know, read this particular poem from the, from the point of view of Laconian psychoanalysis. Laco is an important psychoanalytic uh, theory. And Laco says that before a child is introduced to the world of language, before a child becomes aware of his or herself, you know, before this stage, the child always believes that he or she is a part of the, uh, the, the entire world. The child doesn't distinguish himself from, uh, from, from the world around him or her. Right. So keeping in mind these aspects, let us quickly go through this uh, particular point. The little uh, the lamb. The little lamb who made thee. So lamb, as we all know, in, in this context is representative of the Christ. And uh, because you know, Christ is often referred to in biblical context as a lamb. Little lamb who made thee. Dost thou know who made thee? So this, this small child has no knowledge uh, regarding, the, uh, regarding this lamb. Who made this lamb? Who is the creator of this lamb? Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and over the meat. Gave thee clocking of delight, softest clocking, woolly, bright. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the whales rejoice. Just mark the series of question marks, interrogation marks. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? So the child, as I said, is, is, is asking these questions because the child has not yet developed. His, his mind has not yet developed. And the child also is not ready to distinguish himself from the surrounding environment. The child believes, as I said, that, that the child believes that he is a part of the surrounding environment. And then in the second uh, stanza, you find that the child is slowly understanding or slowly you know, comprehending. And the moment the child starts comprehending, because the child says that I will tell thee. Now this I is here very important. I means now the child, as you find, is slowly understanding, uh, you know, his position. The child is slowly understanding his 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 spatial location. He's understanding that that he he has to uh, learn the language. He has to learn about this lamb. He has to learn about many things. So, little lamb, I will tell thee. Now, I again is important in this context because. As a human, he will tell the lamb. Now, here in comes the very important aspect of instruction. I will tell thee. The lamb will not tell. Now, in the first stanza, the lamb and the child are not, not distinct, not different. But here in the second stanza, the child is assuming what you can say, selfhood, conscious selfhood. And, and he's saying that I will tell thee. So if there are two friends, and one of the friends says that, well, I will tell you, that means the the one who is telling that uh, who is telling I will tell you means you know that particular friend is having some sort of powerful agents. So the child here is 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 saying that I will inform you. I will tell you. So little lamb, I will tell you. Little lamb, I will tell thee. He is called by thy name. So in the second stanza, the child has gained some knowledge. He has already been introduced to the to the what you can say the world of semiotics in the first stanza he the child was in the pre-semiotic stage or the pre-linguistic stage but now the child has gained some uh some what you can say some knowledge uh regarding uh, regarding the state of the lamb regarding his selfhood and that's why he is now giving information he is called by thy name or he called himself a lamb he is meek and his mind, he became a little child. This is full of information. And this information is 
clearly reflective of the fact that the child is being indoctrinated. The child is being taught to look at the lamb from a biblical perspective. So herein comes the very important aspect of indoctrination. The child is being interpolated. The child is being taught to look at the lamb from a particular perspective and not from any other perspective. So in the second standard, the child is learning the ways of ways of being a human and learning to look at look at the things around him. Okay. For he calls himself a lamb, he is meek and he is mild. He became a little lamb, sorry, he became a little child. I a child and thou a lamb. We are called by his name. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. So on one hand, here you see that there is a sort of what you can say, uh, a focus on uh, this, uh, you know, this trinity, uh, child, lamb and God, you know. In this trinity, this uh, child in the in the first stanza, you see that the child, lamb, and God are not different. They are all, uh, as you see, you know, in a sense, uh, together. They are united. But uh, in the second stanza, the, the child has gained knowledge. The child has gained agency, and therefore the child is now giving information. The child is 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 saying this 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 is this and that is that. So the child is now. Uh, uh, the child is, uh, child has been taught to look at the lamb, uh, and and the child has also been taught to look at the lamb from a pres specific perspective. So herein comes the role of education. So when children grow up, how education, you know, cultivates the minds of the infants. How education, uh, uh, or how knowledge enters in the minds of these small children and teach them to look at certain things in, in certain ways. So the child is being ideologically programmed, as you find, to, to look at the lamb from a particular perspective. And this is something which becomes quite clear in the second stanza. So just mark that apparently uh, behind this very simple poem, but that where a child is looking at the lamb and the child is obviously highlighting also the importance of the of this pastoral setting there is uh, this very deep idea hidden how the child is being indoctrinated is being taught to look at the lamb from a specific perspective the child child is being educated and that's why in the second stanza you find that the tone changes i will tell you okay I will, the, the focus is on I, the self. Okay. Now let's focus on the next poem. Uh, as I don't have that much of time, uh, so I have to quickly switch over to the next poem. Now this poem, uh, Tiger, uh, the tiger, as you see, is again a very important poem because uh, in the poem Tiger, uh, you see that uh, there is a clear reflection of uh, this fourfold movement or the fourfold development of the human human mind and body which i discussed earlier okay so uh, uh, from doubt to unity and uh, in the very introductory stanza in the very first stanza of this poem the tiger you see that blake is actually referring to uh, the forests of the night right Forests of the night, in fact, uh, indicate the age-old conventions, superstitions, the prejudices in the society. So how the superstitions, the prejudices in the society have trained humans uh, in such a way that humans now as if are in a dark forest. So age-old conventions, uh, societal prejudices, all these have have created a sort of atmosphere where the humans, according to Blake, feel uh, where the humans, according to Blake, uh, feel that they are in a in a dark forest. So the tiger 
I must repeat and I must say here that the tiger here is not an animal. Blake is not referring to uh, the, to an actual tiger in this point. The Blake Blake here is referring to the tiger, the spirit of the tiger that lies within the human soul. And what is tiger here representative represent uh, rep uh, representative of? The tiger here represents loss, LOS loss, that creative spirit, that imaginative spirit. And forests of the night, the forests of the night, obviously, uh, refer to the doubts, these prejudices, these superstitions, age old conventions have made people doubtful, have created chaos. And that's why the tiger is burning bright. That means loss. I told you that in Blake's philosophy, you know, loss has to work or loss has to be activated in order to restore Albion, restore peace and stability in Albion's life. So uh, the tiger is fighting or the loss, the creative force of loss or the imaginative force of loss is fighting against the forests of the night. And this creative force is creating a tiger. I, I again repeat, not a real tiger because the tiger is in the making. And this tiger is a metaphorical tiger, a tiger that will uh, help humans to uh, to to uh, achieve the unity which uh, they have been uh, seeking for a very long time. So the forest of the night, uh, the, the forest of the night uh, have suppressed the humans. The forests of the night uh, have created a sort of uh, atmosphere where the humans feel that they are they are they are uh, they are in a depressed condition. They are in a in a in a in a in a in a state of perpetual doubt. Now here in the second and the third stanza, I'm not reading out these stanzas, you see that how the tiger is being manufactured. Uh, you know fire chain, anvil, you know, again, you have a reference to the wings, you know, wings obviously mean uh, the figure of the Icarus, you know, the Icarus, as you all know, uh, is a mythical figure who attempted to fly high with waxen beans, but the wings melted and Icarus actually fell down. And uh, uh, there is a reference to also the hand uh, seizing the fire. Uh, this is a reference to the myth of Prometheus. Prometheus was a revolutionary figure. Icarus also was a revolutionary figure. So you find that uh, in the second stanza, Blake is referring to certain revolutionary mythical figures, Icarus, the myth of Icarus, and obviously the Prometheus, uh, you know, the figure of Prometheus. And all these revolutionary figures are important in this context because humans now, according to Blake, need to break the shackles of age old conventions and they, they need to become free. So that's why Blake is describing this tiger, this, this tiger, which obviously would uh, bring a sort of rebellion or would, 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 uh, uh, would uh, actually uh, influence humans to, uh, to revolt against the age old conventions. So it is basically a contest between what you can say, uh, contest between the eurizonic force and the force of loss. So loss and eurizon here are as if fighting. The eurizonic force is very importantly uh, present in the forests of the night and loss, this tiger, this, 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 uh, uh, this, this uh, fiery, fierce tiger, okay, uh, is, is representative of loss, the creative energy the imaginative spirit, spirit. And if you just, uh, you know, go, go to stanza number five, then you see that how, you know, there is reference to the stars, the stars throwing down the spheres. Mm -hmm. The stars, in fact, here mean the mechanist world order. Okay, so you have a reference to the mechanistic world order 
in the poem lamb in the very second stanza when the when the when the uh, you know small child is saying that i will tell you you are this you are a representative of god so this is the mechanistic world order because whenever uh, you know children are taught they are taught to look at things in a specific way and that is what you can say that renders a sort of what you can say a mechanistic viewpoint so the stars when the stars threw down their spheres that means the revolution has already occurred and after the occurring of this after the occurrence of this revolution the stars stars mean the mechanistic world order is 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 crumbling down that means doubt and and division doubt leading to division and so uh, this division slowly is disappearing doubt also is disappearing and watered heaven with the tears in fact in blake's philosophy the stars and uh, you must keep in mind one other thing that loss the figure of the loss is associated with sun and a star is a representative of uh, of of the night you know the mechanistic order that is uh, there in the sky and that is there very much visible during the night so when the stars threw down their spears means mean that those who have been ruling the society those who have been propagating their ideologies in the society they are now no more interested interested in in suppressing the masses because the revolution has occurred and due to this occurrence of revolution the those who were at the helm of the power they are no more interested to dominate the society so uh, a change is occurring because i told you that blake believed that if there is a reformation of the human self then the society also will be reformed so in the fifth stanza the society is reforming when the stars threw down their spheres spheres means obviously uh, a sphere is a weapon that is used in war so the so the stars are no more interested to uh, fight a war against uh, against the uh, against the uh, against the uh, normal people against the people who are who have been exploited for a very long who have been exploited for a very long time and watered heavens with their tears so those who had been ruling the society now they are crying this is a this is a cry of you know this is these are the tears of repentance did he smile his work to see did he who make the lamb make thee so this tiger therefore is representative of the creative spirit the imaginative spirit and when this imaginative spirit explodes the revolution occurs and then obviously the class war comes to an end doubt is eradicated and humans achieve and society achieve that long uh, you know the long waited unity they have the society has been waiting for this waiting for achieving this unity so tiger tiger burning bright in the forests of the night what immortal hand nor eye dear frame thy fear in secret now you can also read as i said that you can read the poem uh, the lamb from the perspective of laconian psychoanalysis and you can also read this uh, poem the tiger from the perspective of desire because you see that when blake is actually saying that you know loss is working uh, loss uh, as a creative energy is working very strongly to eradicate uh, the influence of or to stop the influence of doubt and thereby uh, thereby render peace and stability to albion and they thereby render a sort of stability uh, uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the society and society is in a state of what you can say reformation society is, is is getting reformed what is quite interesting is the fact that you can also as i said read this particular poem from the perspective of desire so human desire uh, has been suppressed for a very long time society has ruled over the minds of the people those who uh, have been at the helm of the society the rulers of the society they have implanted their ideologies in the minds of the common people and these people have ruled the 
minds of the people for a very long time. And ruling the minds also mean, you know, suppressing the desire, the desire, the desires of the common people, the desire in the souls of the common people, you know, has been suppressed. But now, when after this revolution has occurred, there has occurred a sort of what you can say liberation of desire. And with this liberation of desire, what has happened? Humans have achieved freedom. Now, this concept of liberation of desire can also be uh, studied from the perspective of Deluge and Guattari. Deluge and Guattari are post-structuralist critics. And Deluge and Guattari are you know, two very important critics who speak uh, about what you can say, uh, the idea of being in a kind of a uh, being in a kind of a space where 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 you know the, where the influence of any large structure is absent. So Deleuze and Guattari always, in their theory, talk about this concept of liberation of desire, and they they very importantly also talk about the idea of uh, assuming a sort of what you can say outlook that is anti-structural outlook. So, forest of the night is 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 idiomatically representative of a structure, a large conventional structure. And in the fifth st uh, stanza, you see that this structure is disappearing or is breaking down because the stars are throwing down their spheres. So, anti-structural attitude, anti-structural attitude, and therefore. You know, it is like, you know, the human desire is getting liberated. The liberation of human desire, this also is a very important aspect in the poem, the type. And apart from that, as I told you, you can also study this particular poem, the tiger, from the perspective of the conflict between, the contest between uh, the eugenic force and the force of the loss, LOS loss. So with these uh, words and with these ideas, I'd like to conclude my discussion today. I think I've taken almost uh, more than an hour. And uh, thank you for patiently attending my uh, lecture. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your exhaustive and insightful session. It was really wonderful and uh, loaded with the different information for our students. Uh, sir, may I take a few questions? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Muskan Jain had written, what is Blake's philosophy on perception? Oh, yes. Uh, I think uh, students have uh, put their question in the message, right? In the message box. Yeah, I can yeah, read, yeah, yeah, I can yeah, read yeah, the message yeah, box. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So okay. the first question has been asked by Muskan Jan. And Muskan is asking, what is Blake's philosophy on perception? No, uh, Blake has no such philosophy on perception. I said that uh, uh, Blake actually is, uh, is providing uh, a philosophy that uh, can help us to understand you know his perspective on human self so blake has a distinctive philosophy the philosophy that i have already explained you know this philosophy where a man is uh, is ha a man is composed of or a man actually is having uh, in his own self four different psychical energies and you know the growth of the man is uh, a fourfold kind of a growth where uh, at the beginning there is doubt, then division, then there is illumination, and at the end the unity is achieved. So this is, you know, in a nutshell, Blake's philosophy. And Blake's philosophy, as I told you, is very importantly directed to uh, the idea of achieving what you can say a sort of social reformation. Humans need to reform themselves, and with that, as I said, Blake believes society also will will be reformed. So this is uh, how I would like to respond to the first question. The second question, yes, in the spelling of the tiger, we find Y instead of yes. Blake actually uses the archaic spelling. Uh, in the archaic uh, spelling, you know, tig I was not used, Y was used. And Blake has this you know, fascination 
uh, for uh, the archaic words Blake often uses in his uh, poems in these archaic words because he felt uh, that these archaic words probably uh, you know gave Blake probably gave Blake a sort of what you can say uh, a feeling that he was in the old world because Blake you see was very much unhappy with this uh, massive urbanization massive industrialization and therefore he always wanted to go back to the old times old days so maybe you know he uh, used the word uh, tiger t y g d g r because of his fascination for the old times uh, the next question is uh, related to yes uh, doubt yes molly jana has asked a question how is doubt related to chaos Yes, doubt is related to chaos because once doubt enters in the mind of a person, Blake believes, then there occurs a sort of disorder. Because it is because of doubt that man starts thinking, uh, and and man then you know uh, then then man then uh, falls in a state of dilemma. You know what to do and what not to do, uh, and then 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 indecision begins. So doubt therefore leads to a leads to disorder and chaos and this disorder and chaos uh, is very importantly represented in the second uh, stage that Blake says that is you know division doubt leading to division but this division can be countered can be contested if the loss is active if the loss is active then man can be illuminated man can you know take the help of his imaginative uh, imaginative idea and can tackle these doubts and can restore uh, restore the peace and the stability which existed before the occurrence of doubt. So doubt therefore obviously creates uh, chaos. Uh, the next, uh, what was William Blake's purpose for writing the poem Tiger? Well, uh, his purpose was very clear, I think. Uh, you know, he wanted to uh, convince people about uh, the importance of uh, what you can say uh, importance of this imaginative spirit because i said that in the poem tiger blake ba basically manifests the importance of the working of loss you know it is it is because of this loss this creative energy that a tiger is being manufactured right and it is being manufactured in by a blacksmith and you have references to the tools that a blacksmith uses and will chain hammer right so this loss is actually creating uh, this this uh, this revolution. So Blake wrote this particular poem, Tiger, because he wanted people to understand the importance of imagination. And as I told you, that during that point of time in the in the last uh, in the last two decades of the 18th century, people slowly were becoming more and more rational in their approach. Imagination uh was 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 it was being marginalized and therefore blake felt that people must develop or inculcate this uh, this idea of uh, imagination and people must not get uh, uh, people must not lose touch of imagination because if imagination is lost then blake believed people would be turned into mechanistic beings so instead of becoming mechanistic beings Blake wanted humans to live as humans. And that's why he here very importantly focuses on uh, the significance of revolution, significance of this creative energy, significance of laws or imagination. That's why he wrote the poem Tiger. In what sense can Blake be called a romantic poet? Well, romantic because he is, as I told you at the very beginning of my discussion, he's an iconoclast. He is, uh, uh, he is very much against what you can say, the set order in the society. He is very much against, uh, as you find, uh, very much against any kind of uh, any kind of uh, knowledge that uh, seeks to uh, tame the human mind. Because you see that in the poem London, in the very second stage, in this very second stanza, the child is uh, gathering knowledge, and the child has already started, you know passing this information. I will tell you. Yeah. So what is important is the fact that the child is, as I told you, is being indoctrinated. So the child, the, this mind of the child obviously needs to be, what you can say, brainwashed. The, the child 
needs to be aware of counter knowledge counter uh, counter uh, uh, domains of knowledge you know or you can say alternative knowledge systems okay so that's why blake through his points attempted to uh, you know show the humans uh, the importance of these alternative knowledge systems why should humans be trained to look at the world from a particular perspective forests of the night is about uh, a sort of perspective that society uh, you know is trying to embed in the minds of the people uh, what is the significance of fearful symmetry fearful symmetry is uh, a reference to the body of the tiger it's fearful because obviously it is fighting against the forest of the night age old conventions the uh, the, the so called the age old ideologies the ideologies that cripple the minds of the people and i told you that in the poem london you find a reference to this phrase mind for mind for miracles so uh, this fearful symmetry this very tiger is actually fighting against the so called the forces the dark forces uh, then obviously does the style and the language of the poem lamb seem childish no i i i, I didn't say that it is childish it is no way uh, childish because uh, as i told you that it contains very deep philosophical ideas and uh, you no know, good and bad i don't think you should uh, involve in any kind of value judgment uh, because blake has written these simple poems but as i told you these are simple but very complex poems complex if you look at it from the perspective of blake uh, how does this poem tiger relate to the blake's other poem the lamb yes tiger and lamb are different because you know tiger is about uh, about uh, you know mature humans tiger is about uh, you know about people who have grown up and lamb is uh, about a child a child who has who, who is yet to learn the ways of the life so in that way you know these are the two contrary sides you know an immature child and in the case of tiger in the case of tiger there is a reference to mature men so that is the difference again in the lamb where i represents instructive as usual i represents desperate no 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 i is i believe representative of the idea of selfhood uh, the self is very important very much important the i is also as i told is indicative of uh, assertion the child is asserting uh, its impo uh, his importance and it is also indicative of the fact that the child has been uh, indoctrinated and that's why the child instead of using the word i in the first stanza he uses it in the second because the child has by that time already gained a bit of knowledge uh so does the poem tiger indicate to industrial revolution in england yes uh, it, it 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 i as i told you it is very importantly related to industrial revolution because blake wrote these poems i told you that blake's poems can be read as a response to industrial revolution and also as a response to french revolution and also as a response to the enlightenment discourse so i think i have answered all the questions thank you sir thank you very much now i would love to uh, dr prijato ghosh to give today's vote of thanks he is the convener of our organizing committee and he is also the assistant professor of our department department of english delhi college so over to you sir uh, can i be heard or no can i be heard Yes, yes. Uh, can yeah, I be seen? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank sure. you, thank you, thank you very, very much. Uh, uh, I feel a bit unfortunate because uh, I would have loved to listen to uh, Dr. Dr. Sina a lot more. I was uh, absolutely uh, it was a splendid lecture, Dr. Dr. Sina, and I feel very honored and privileged to have you have you here. I and uh, my the other convener of this organizing committee, uh, Kueli Shingo, is also there. She is also the student professor. she was also telling me so it was a wonderful lecture it was it was really wonderful listening to you uh, and uh, regarding the vote of thanks yes definitely uh, first and foremost i would like to uh, on behalf of the organizing committee i would like to thank today speaker dr anup kumar sena uh, who despite uh, of his very busy schedule has found time to grace this occasion and enrich us with uh, this extremely valuable lecture on william blake uh, talking about it that I was thinking about it that uh, really I was uh, thinking about Paul Miner, uh, one of our uh, very famous critics. Doctor Sir, must be must be knowing. And 
he in one of his uh, very famous article uh, wrote about blake that blake himself had said that to find the meaning in tiger is almost like uh, searching yes. for epigrams in homer so <laughs> i i I'm, I'm, i'm really honored that uh, i've listened to something that uh, yes blake is is difficult as you had said blake is complex but blake is understandable and i once again uh, thank uh, dr sinner for giving such a splendid lecture and i think our students and students from the other universities and colleges because it is being try it is being streamed live on youtube they must be finding it extremely enthralling and interesting is a really very intriguing interesting and provocative one uh, i must thank dr sinner thank you very much thank you thank, thank you so much uh and uh, i also express my heartfelt thanks to uh, dr manobendra mangro principal build the college for continuously encouraging us to take this initiative and uh, cooperating and extending his full support for the success of this of this eventful day for the success of this lecture series today is the first day of this lecture series i'm grateful to all the teachers students scholars enthusiasts of other colleges and universities and other institutions who are here in this Google Meet and uh, uh, listening to this YouTube live, uh, who have actively participated in today's lecture and enriched us with important questions and comments. My heartfelt thanks uh, goes to all the teachers of Build the College, uh, students of departments other than English, uh, and definitely the students of the Department of English, Build the College, uh, who have actively participated in today's lecture. Uh, without whose uh, inspiration participation contribution such a series possibly could not have taken place uh, i must thank uh, mr shubhi shah department of bca belda college who has lended all the technical support within a very short span of time to uh, make this day a successful one uh, last but not the least i thank all the members of the organizing committee each and every of them really who have worked day and night for the success of this uh, of this particular day the first day of the Uh, 60 online lectures lecture series and uh, thank you very much thank you all and with the kind permission of the speaker uh, and the principal of our college dr manobendra mandol uh, may i please declare today's session today's uh, uh, lecture session uh, the first day of this 6 day online lecture series on english literature 2021 organized by the department of english belda college as closed but we'll be meeting tomorrow definitely with another wonderful speech thank you thank you thank you dr sinha thank you thank you so much really uh, and i also as being a convener i i think i can take the privilege to uh, once again invite you to uh, to some of the future sure, lecture sure. series that we will organize sure, in future sure. love really love listening to you thank My you pleasure. very much no problem okay thank, <laughs> thank you. you so